If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. The Alliance for Democracies' mission is in part to establish a true democracy. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Dan Meek. Dan is a public interest attorney here in Portland who is well known for his advocacy of and use of the initiative process for having written measures 46 and 47 in the 2006 ballot for limiting campaign contributions and expenditures as well as establishing other requirements for political campaigns. He's also a co-founder of the Oregon Progressive Party. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, David. Great. So our, our topic today is the ballot measures, which will be on the November uh, ballot coming right up. I think there is seven measures uh, covering a variety of topics, and I know you want to focus on uh, just uh, two or three of them. Uh, yes, we could start with um, Measure 90, which is kind of a um, less understood measure. I mean, Measure uh, 91, the legalization of possession of small amounts of marijuana, that's pretty well understood. Um, the Measure 92, which would require labeling for foods containing genetically engineered materials, that's understood, but Measure 90 is really kind of an inside baseball mm -hmm. political measure that changes the process for nominating and electing candidates. And I think that's um, something that will affect all policies. It'll affect taxes, the budget, environmental protection, and everything uh, by changing the, the, the persons who are elected to government in Oregon. Okay, and uh, w so what would the effects of, of that be? Well, um, I think it would increase the power of the corporate establishment in Oregon, first of all, by eliminating all minor party candidates and petitioned for candidates from the general election ballot. Top two has been, top two primary, that's what Measure 90 is, has been in effect now in Washington since 2008 and California since 2012, and that's, that's been its effect. It, it has eliminated all minor party candidates from the statewide ballot and all minor party candidates from, from every race for the legislature and every race for Congress where at least two major party candidates filed to run in the primary to begin with. So the only time a minor party candidate gets on the ballot now in the top two primary states is when only, only one major party candidate has filed to run in the election. It's all, it will also switch important decisions about who um, wins public office from the general election in November to the primary election, which uh, Oregon uh, by law holds in May, um, those that's very that's an important switch because primary voters generally are far more uh, uh, they are older, they are whiter, and they are far more Republican than the general election um, the folks who turn out for the general election. So basically, it takes important decisions, moves it into the hands of a far more more conservative uh, electorate. Um, it also have a particular uh, deleterious effects on the Democratic Party. Not that I'm here to defend the Democratic Party, since I'm the uh, uh, co-chair of the Independent Party of Oregon, mm -hmm. among other things. That, but um, it would have a particularly bad effect for them because it would, because of the way districting works, it will cause far more Democrats to run against each other in the primary election. They'll have to spend money uh, running against each other. And in effect, it will mean that even in Democratic districts, Republicans will choose which Democrat wins. Hmm. Okay. And um, the primary election usually has far lower turnout than the general election. That's true. Um, in Oregon, general elections have been running around mm, 75, 80 percent turnout, and primary elections are um, usually about half of that. Okay, so so the top two would allow uh, the determination of who actually runs in the general election to be decided by the fewest number of voters. That's true. The way the way the system works now is that uh, a candidate can get on the general election ballot for a partisan office, and by that we mean basically the the more important statewide offices like governor, attorney general, secretary of state, uh, and treasurer. Um, or any of the federal offices like Congress or President, and any of the uh, 
offices for the legislature, like the state um, uh, House of Representatives or the state Senate, mm -hmm. and some county commission offices are elected on a partisan basis. That means party labels are shown on the ballot. Um, the way the system works now is that um, the major parties, that is parties which have more than 5% of Oregon voters registered as members of the party, are they select their candidates through state-run primary elections in which every member of the party uh, gets the same vote. Um, this was a process that was adopted by Oregon voters by initiative in 1904 to replace the previous system where uh, major party candidates, Democrats and Republicans at that time, uh, were chosen behind, behind closed doors in the proverbial smoke-filled rooms. Mm -hmm. So having major party primaries that were um, open to every voter and would determine the outcome of the primary was actually one of the, one of the um, innovations of the progressive era uh, in Oregon <clears throat> in 1904. In addition to that, in Oregon, we have six minor parties, officially seven, but one of them will be going, uh, long story, American Select Party, <laughs> going away. Um, six minor parties. and they can nominate candidates using their own processes. Some use their own primaries, where they allow every member of the party to vote like the Independent Party does and the Libertarian Party does. Others have um, conventions uh, where they invite all of their members to attend and take part like the uh, Pacific Green Party does. And others use caucuses like the um, and meetings like the Progressive Party does. And they each now get to nominate candidates for the, for the November ballot under Measure 90 of course they wouldn't they all of their they would not have any power to nominate anyone for the general election finally there is also the opportunity under the existing system to get on the general election ballot by collecting enough signatures to do so for a statewide race it's about thirty thousand signatures we last had a um, a statewide officer who was elected in that means in 1930 when julius meyer was elected governor mm -hmm. uh... and in the as the um, as the depression had had taken effect and and voters were very dissatisfied with both of the of the major party candidates. Um, one thing that the um, proponents of Measure 90, you know, their their big argument is that is that oh my goodness, if you go to the primary election and you're not a member of a major party, the Democrats or Republicans, you don't get to vote for candidates in the primary election. Well, that's currently, of course, untrue for most candidates because in Oregon, most races are nonpartisan. There is no party label on the ballot and everybody gets to vote for those candidates in those races. Uh, as far as partisan races go, of course, anyone can, can become a member of a party and vote in that party's primary or take part in that, that party's process, um, as long as they do so in the case of a primary election 20 days before the primary, so that's open to everyone. Um, but finally, what the proponents don't ever state is is the major change that's coming to Oregon in the next primary election anyway even if measure 90 is not adopted and that is that there will now there in 2016 there will be three major party three major parties on the primary ballots instead of just two hmm. the independent party of Oregon currently has over 104,000 members as soon as it reaches 108,000 it will become by law Oregon's third major party and will be treated just like the Democrats and Republicans have its own you know, primary election in May of 2016 hmm. and the um, the leadership of the independent party has stated its intent to open that primary to non-affiliated voters so that means that that primary will have will be open to the hundred and some odd thousand independent party members plus the over 500,000 non-affiliated voters in Oregon will probably be around uh, 650,000 people will be able to vote in that primary election in 2016, which will make it the same size as the Republican primary. And so if the big problem is that, oh my goodness, people who are not members of major parties don't get to vote for or, you know, four candidates in the, in the primary election, that's already uh, under current law going um, not, not the situation in 2016. Mm -hmm that independent, in the members of the independent party and non-affiliated voters will be able to vote for their own candidates. Okay, so that would take away you know, a, a major argument for uh, actually passing this. It would, but I think the, the, um, the real point of this is that's kind of the stated reason. The unstated reason or the unstated motivation for Measure 90 is to, as I said, increase the, the 
the political power of the corporate establishment. And I think it's interesting to look at who's funding this primary, this this uh, ballot measure. Yeah, measure yeah that was that was going to be my next question: was who's funding this? <clears throat> well, just in the past week, we have the as the you know, mandatory campaign reporting laws kick in, um, we have found that the the that one single person has provided more than two thirds of the funding for the yes side of this measure. One single person has contributed a million and a half dollars to the yes side, and this person is John Arnold. Now, who is John Arnold? Well, John Arnold first made his mark on society as an Enron energy trader, as Enron was creating the phony West Coast energy crisis in 1999, 2000, and 2001. You may recall this was the the energy crisis. Mm -hmm that caused rolling blackouts in, in along the west coast. Uh, later studies said it cost the state of California consumers over 42 billion dollars in excess costs. These were, these were the folks who were, who were um, manipulating energy markets, some were later convicted of, of criminally doing so, where they would um, you know, manipulate energy flows, uh, shut down perfectly operating power plants, uh, in order to increase the price that they could get, you know, that they that they could make on their power uh, sales, these were the folks when they saw a, a a brush fire approaching the major, a very major transmission line connecting California and the Northwest, said, "Burn, baby, burn! It's a beautiful thing." <laughs> these folks, they were they were recorded, they, their phone calls were recorded and, and later uh, revealed as a result of uh, depositions in, in litigation. And, and, and the reason why they were so excited about this fire was because if it de destroyed the transmission line, then the electric rates would, would, would raise as a result? Well, the, tra the transmission line wouldn't need to be destroyed, just, just a fire, because of a fire heating up the area, they, they also have to derate the line. That is, they have to, instead of carrying 4,000 megawatts, it would only have to carry, it would only be able to carry 1,000 megawatts, and that would disrupt energy markets cause electricity prices to go up and make them money. Uh-huh, okay, yes. So he was one of the top energy, Enron energy traders. Um, one day before Enron declared bankruptcy in, 20, in 2001, he received an $8 million bonus from Enron. At, after he left Enron, well, actually after Enron had left him by declaring bankruptcy and dissolving, um, he, started his, he started a hedge fund, uh, made a billion dollars, and now is a major funding of what I would call very regressive measures around the around the country, cutting you know public employee pensions among other things, and you know, promoting this this top two top two scheme. The other mm -hmm. major contributors are basically a who's who of Oregon businesses, large businesses and industries, uh, the Automobile Dealers Association of Oregon, Nike, the Restaurant Association, insurance companies, utilities, uh, various uh, folks who have inherited company the leadership of companies from their, from their parents, um, and a lot of private investment companies and private financiers. Um, but uh, you just won't find, I mean, I mean these folks have a, any, I think a pretty clear agenda. Yeah. Any, any ordinary citizens such as myself? No. Um, the, I guess what they would qualify as ordinary citizens are the Koch brothers. They're, um, the, the third largest contributor now to the Yes on Measure 90 campaign is the Associated Oregon Industries Political Committee in mm -hmm. Oregon. And over the past um, three years, um, that political committee has received $60,000 in contributions directly from the Koch brothers, from Koch Industries. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're also on the side of, they're funding the organizations that are then funding the Yes on, on 90 campaign. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and um, I think it's important um, for folks to realize how much this would destroy the meaning of party labels on the ballot. Um, the way Measure 90 works is that all candidates who want to run for a particular office have to, have to decide that very early and have to file by the first week of March of the election year in order to run in the primary. Everybody for an office runs in the same pool and, and all voters get to vote on that pool. And um, the parties can't in any way control who is able to use the label of the party on the ballot. So, for example... Uh, under, under Measure 90, under they measure would not 90. be able to. So anyone could um, go to the... could go online 
register as, let's say, a Democrat, file to run in the primary election for governor or anything else, and be identified on the ballot as registered Democratic. And it doesn't matter if the person's a, a convicted child molester or a, a white power advocate or whatever, um, the party cannot do anything to take, to take that registered Democratic label off the person's name on the ballot. The and same thing is true for, for someone like that could run and, oh, I'm, I'm registered progressive. That's on the ballot. I'm, I, am I, I'm identified with the progressive party. Have nothing to do with the Progressive Party, okay. and so I assume that someone who actually was a Republican could re-register for this purpose as a Democrat. Well, that's true, and um, that raises um, a major problem in that it this system is is the only system I know of which has this major flaw that the ability of any candidate to win the primary election depends upon the number of other persons who filed to run in the primary election and use the same party label. Um, a good example of that is California's 31st Congressional District in um, 2012, the first year uh, top two was in effect there. It's a very um, democratic district created, in about 19, it was created after the 1960 census with California's you know, increasing population. It's around Santa Monica. It has never elected anything except a Democrat and usually by overwhelming margins. But in 2012, the incumbent Democrat wasn't running, so naturally up-and-coming local Democratic politicians want to you know, move up to Congress. So four of them filed to run in the primary against two Republicans who filed to run in the primary. So you can imagine what happened. The four Democrats split the Democratic vote quite evenly, mm -hmm. and as a result, only two Republicans advanced to the general election, which caused an overwhelmingly Democratic um, district to have the choice between only two Republicans in the general election. Well, and that came uh, within four tenths of a percent of a vote of happening in this year. Mm -hmm. It came within seven tenths of a percent of a vote of happening in a statewide race in California this mm -hmm. year. So because of that, that obviously encourages game playing. If I'm a Republican operative, the, one of the best ways that I can advance the interests of, of Republican candidates on the, on the primary ballot is to recruit phony Democrats to run. And of course, in that same race, and of course it works the same way. In California, a, a candidate named Ro Khanna for a congressional seat, um, Democrat, um, actually recruited Republicans to run in his race, one of whom had, a na had, had virtually the same name as the most popular Republican running in the seat already. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it causes um, the opportunity for, for a lot of a lot of trickery to be played in, in to determine who goes to the general election, and it also um, means that that legitimate local candidates need to be discouraged from running. That is, if you have a situation like like in California, where um, there are lots of local folks of the uh, let's say that the of the dominant political party in the area wanting to run, the party has the party leaders have to go around and actually discourage people from running, and that's what the the party chair in Washington uh, said after Prop 2 was implemented there that now part of his job is going around to people who want to run for office and encouraging them not to run for office because if they do, they could split the vote of the party adherents on the primary election ballot and advance only, only members of the other party the, to the general election. Hmm. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I, I, I recall that uh, when uh, we had measures 46 and 47 on the on the, on the ballot for campaign finance reform. Uh, the opponents of that uh, talked a lot about the unintended consequences of, of that measure of those measures. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears now with measure 90 that we could talk about the intended consequences of this measure, which would uh, effectively destroy uh, the meaning of party labels. Uh, and destroy the ability of minor parties to participate in the general election. Um, that's true. That's what is, has been happening in Washington and, and California since they recently implemented Top 2. The proponents say, oh, it will increase voter turnout in the primary election, but it hasn't. Both in California and Washington, they have suffered under Top 2 their record low turnout in the primary. It also affects turnout in the general election, particularly if the only choice is between members of the same party. Um, in Oregon, that will happen much more frequently with Democrats, by the way, because 
simply because of the way single member districts are drawn. Um, there are many more districts in Oregon that are very heavily Democratic in registration, where the likely outcome of top two will be two Democrats on the general election ballot, which means the Democrats can fight among each other and spend money to defeat each other. That's what's happening in California now. In California, there are 28, going to be 28 races on their general election ballot this year, where it's only one, you know, one party, two members, one party on the general election ballot. 20 of those are Democrat versus Democrat. And so that's another reason that this is really a, you know, a, a, a pro-business conservative right-wing measure because it sets up, simply because of the way it fits into to legislative districting, it sets up in Oregon many more Democrats that have to fight each other in the general election than, than will occur for Republicans. Probably in Oregon there will be nine or ten seats in the legislature every year that are going to be Democrat on Democrat in the general, maybe one or two seats that are of that'll be Republican versus Republican okay okay the uh, Koch brothers are supporting this measure in Oregon but they haven't done that in in every state where this issue has been on the ballot can you talk about that sure um, here in Oregon as I mentioned the Koch brothers are one of the largest contributors to Associated Oregon Industries PAC and that PAC is in turn the third largest contributor to the yes on measure 90 campaign um, the reason the Koch brothers would support Measure 90 in Oregon is because of the, of the reasons I've mentioned. It, it is particularly damaging to the Democratic Party in Oregon um, by causing Democratic candidates to have to fight each other in the general election, by moving the important decisions from the general election where Democrats turn out to the, to the primary election where, where generally Republicans have much higher turnout. The Koch brothers were not involved and, and didn't support or oppose the measures in Washington in 2004 or um, California in 2010. They did oppose, or Oregon in 2008, they did oppose the Arizona measure in 2012. And it's because the, the you know, political operatives and, and, and such perceive a top two measure as, as reducing the, the power of the dominant political party of the state, of the political party with the most registrants. And in Oregon, of course, that is the Democratic Party, and that's something that the Koch brothers would like to tear down. Um, in Arizona, it's the Republican Party. And so top two implemented in, in Arizona would, would, in their perception, reduce the, the power of the Republican Party, and so they opposed it. It's, you know, it, it's sort of like, remember when um, there were all those proposals around to split up the electoral, the, the electoral college votes by, mm -hmm. in proportion to each state's vote? Right. Those were Republican proposals, but they were only made in Democratic states because they only wanted the Democratic electoral votes to be, for president to be split up instead of being awarded on a, on a, a, you know, a winner-take-all basis. Same thing here. Top two is pushed by the corporate community, but only in states which are, um, which, uh, for which the Democratic Party is, is by far the stronger party over the mm -hmm. Republicans. When the same thing is proposed in states like Arizona, the corporate community opposes it. Hmm. Okay, so, so no principles involved? Um, just the, outcome, just, is, just, outcome, just, right, uh, outcome and power is involved, yes. Uh, uh, right, yeah, okay, good. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten to the other two measures we wanted to talk about, and we only have three minutes left. Well, talk really briefly, obviously, about labeling GMOs. What, what's the big issue there? Um, well, the big issue is that um, genetically modified materials are being inserted into more and more foods. In fact, most of the corn in the United States it does have genetically modified uh, material in it. By genetically modified, we mean gene spliced into the thing. Um, there are now tomatoes on the market that, are, that have fish genes in them. Uh, many crops have built-in built pesticides now uh, in them and also built-in pesticide antidotes. That is, the, much of the wheat in America is now called Roundup Ready because it has a antidote to Roundup pesticide built into it by, by gene splicing. As a result, uh, farmers can, can load up their, their fields with Roundup, kill everything except these genetically modified crops. And uh, folks, um, you can't tell by going to the store or anywhere else whether, whether the food that you're buying uh, includes these genetically modified organisms. 
64 countries around the world, including all of European countries, European Union, Japan, etc., require labeling of, of GMO foods so people can make a choice as to whether to whether to eat these um, these foods that are modified in ways that uh, that don't happen in nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, with one minute left, who is financing the opposition oh, to goodness. labeling? Um, so far, the there is over seven million dollars reported. It'll it'll probably go up to fifteen million or more, and it's it's a who's who of 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 chemical companies like Monsanto and a who's who of food companies, um, um, uh, you know, Pepsi, um, you know, yeah. beverage companies, grocery companies, etc. Um, but the the large by far the larger contributor the largest contributors are chemical companies, the mm -hmm. ones who who make mo genetically modified organisms and seeds. Yeah, yeah. So when, when I when I looked, it was Monsanto at this point, 1.5 million dollars, PepsiCo at 1.4 million dollars, and then uh, General Mills, Kraft, Hershey's, Schmuckers, and all of these food companies uh, that are um, financing the opposition to labeling. Uh, with so the, it, it's with a name like Schmuckers. <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. It must be genetically modified. <laughs> it must be, right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, thank you, Dan, very much for being okay. on the show. All right. All right. Good. Our guest today has been Dan Meek, co-founder of the Oregon Progressive Party and public interest attorney here in Portland. The Alliance for Democracy does not take positions in support or opposition to candidates for political office. However, we do so on ballot measures. On um, Measure 90, which we've just been talking about, we do recommend a no vote. Measure 90 would create a top two primary system. We think that instead of calling it a top two, it should be called the keep minor parties out of the general elections proposal. Let's keep what little choice and democracy we have in our elections by voting no on Measure 90. Reg regarding Measure 92, uh, which would require the labeling of GMO of foods, the Alliance for Democracy recommends a yes vote. We have the right to know what is in our foods. This measure would not cause huge increases in the cost of foods. Such labels are already required in nations around the world. And we know that such labels will not confuse consumers. We think that American consumers are just as intelligent as Asian, European, or African c consumers. So let's label our food. Let's vote yes on measure 92. We want to thank our volunteers who donate their time to get our program on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Melissa Hayes, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope that we'll see you again in about two weeks. Bye. Think corporations bought free speech before. Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me